Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly, ready to return. The Vatican has an important update on the health of Pope Francis. Fighting back, how a pro-life group is responding to a lawsuit from the New York Attorney General. Getting started, a report from Orlando on the first public day of the U.S. Bishop's Spring Assembly. And who is St. Joseph to me? European artists gather in France to honor St. Joseph. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us. Our top story tonight, the Vatican says Pope Francis will be released from the hospital tomorrow. The Holy Father has been recovering well from his abdominal surgery earlier this month. And today he visited the children's cancer ward at the Gemelli Hospital. He also met with hospital staff. Pope Francis is expected to resume, at least in part, his normal schedule starting on Sunday. Well, back here in the United States, a pair of Republican senators are holding up nominations in the Justice Department and the Department of Defense. The lawmakers accuse the DOJ of putting politics over law and say the Department of Defense is breaking the law in its efforts to provide taxpayer funding for service members to have an abortion. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with the latest. Eric. Well, good evening, Tracy. You know, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance plans to, quote, grind the Justice Department to a halt on all of its nominees. This after the DOJ decided to bring indictment charges against former President Donald Trump. He tells me that the, it's the latest example of the agency being used for political purposes. We have Catholic fathers harassed for their pro-life activism. We, of course, have violent criminals walking the streets after the 2020 uh, summer of riots. And if you're letting the violent criminals go free and you're harassing Christian parents for their political activism, you're not engaged in justice, you're engaged in politics. Reaction to his boycott came along party lines. They're not stopping the nominations. They can go, they can go, to the, uh, the, go through the regular process. This is just to stop them from accelerating the process. So every senator's got the right to do this. For Republican colleagues to say, therefore, stronger policing or law enforcement and then stop the Department of Justice, which is the major law enforcement agency in this country, is absurd and important. As EWTN News Nightly reported, Senator Tommy Tuberville continues his fight to make the Defense Department reverse its policy of using tax dollars to pay travel-related abortion expenses for current service members. You believe they are breaking the law? I don't think there's any doubt. I mean, you can't do this. I mean, you can't you can't make the law from the Pentagon. You just can't do it. And uh, if we're going to do that, let's just lock these buildings up and save the taxpayer a lot of money. Go home. Senator Tuberville is holding up more than 250 military nominations, including a replacement for the Joint Chiefs of Staff Chair, General Mark Milley. This is a, pipe, a fight that the Pentagon started, that they're the ones that changed a policy, which most of us feel uh, is against the law, that it's against the Hyde Amendment. So we're standing right beside uh, Coach Tuberville. I think what Senator Tuberville has done is just awful. We, are, we believe that Republican senators, if they care about national security, but should be putting pressure on him uh, to release those holds. Now, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer could hold individual votes, but that would take a great deal of time. And it's not just Republicans who are holding up nominees. The chairman of the Health Committee, Senator Bernie Sanders, says that he is holding up nominees of President Biden, also because they have not worked on lowering prescription drug prices enough. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. For the second day in a row, the White House and dozens of state lawmakers from around the United States meet to discuss abortion. They want to keep it legal in places that already allow it. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, today the White House says 32 legislators from 16 states met here doing what the Biden administration calls, quote, working to safeguard access to abortion care, end quote. As more states vote to protect life in the womb, meetings continue at the White House to, quote, discuss state-level attacks on reproductive rights. But pro-life group Live Action says abortion is not empowering and releases this video. Because at 22, I was told that it wouldn't hurt. I was told that I would be okay. I was told that it would fix what was broken, which was a baby that I did not have time, money, resources, or emotional stability for. 
and all of those things were a lie. At the U.S. State Department, Secretary of State Antony Blinken discusses the 2023 Trafficking in Persons report, adding the U.S. is committed to combating human trafficking. Because it represents an attack on human rights and freedoms, violates the universal right of every person to have autonomy over their own life and actions. Today, more than 27 million people around the world are denied that right. Also today at the White House, President Joe Biden talks about a big concern for consumers, junk fees. I want to thank members of Congress who are working on legislation to address these junk fees and ticketing, lodging, and other industries. And a new candidate enters the race for the White House, Miami Mayor Francis Suarez seeking the Republican nomination. I'm going to run for president. I'm going to run for your children and mine. Let's give them the future they deserve. Now, back to those junk fees. Rest assured, they're more than just about money. Ahead of the 2024 presidential election, President Biden trying to show consumers, who of course are also voters, that the government can help their daily lives. And there's about a year and a half to go in case you're keeping a record at home until the 2024 presidential contest and the field of candidates is pretty much solidified at the White House. Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, as we reported yesterday, a pro-life group is accusing New York's attorney general of intimidation and restricting freedom of speech. This after Democrat Leticia, Leticia James asked a court to ban members of the Red Rose Rescue Group from going within 30 feet of an abortion business. The Red Rose Group sometimes enters abortion businesses in order to provide women with resources to help them continue their pregnancies. And we go now to Catherine Jean, Jean Lopez, senior fellow at the National Review Institute and editor at large of National Review. Catherine, great to see you again. Um, a lot great to time. unpack here. Uh, but first, the attorney general called the Red Rose Rescue Group, quote, bigoted zealots and accused members of terrorizing abortion workers and those seeking an abortion. Really strong words there. Um, your thoughts on all of this? Yeah, at the press conference that announced this lawsuit, lawmakers called them terrorists, anti-abortion extremists, despicable characters. Um, one, um, one I, I believe it was the attorney general said that in one of the uh, instances that is cited, they occupied the waiting room. Now, we have a noble tradition of civil disobedience in the United States. Um, in other cases, if these were other issues, uh, people might be celebrating, the attorney general might be celebrating Father Fidelis and, and some of the other Red Rose rescuers. Um, but instead, this nonviolent resistance to evil is being called terrorism. Um, again, if you are if you follow Red Rose Rescue, they're not violent. Yes, they break the law. Um, they go into uh, lobbies, in, in some cases, of abortion clinics and offer women red roses and resources. What, what dignity to, to offer a woman a rose? Uh, when they're asked to leave, they, they don't. And, and sometimes say, we'll leave when the abortion doctors leave. And so they wind up getting arrested. But they know what they're getting into when they do that. That. And once again, not violent. Catherine Jean, can we talk about the lawsuit itself now? What more can you tell us about that? Well, you know, unclear because one, one of the things that the lawsuit says that not only the members of Red Rose Rescue, but anybody who works in concert with them could be in, uh, have legal difficulties, which include injunctions against them and fines. What does it mean to be in concert with Red Rose Rescue? That may mean you give them money. That may mean you support them. Am I in concert with Red Rose Rescue? I don't, I'm not a Red Rose Rescuer. I don't think everyone is called to do such things, um, but I support their their right to choose non a, a nonviolent civil disobedience, like Dorothy Day, you know, who not a saint yet, but but the uh, almost patron saint of civil disobedience. Um, so it's uh, unclear, but what is clear is New York State, 
the abortion capital of the United States, wants to make sure that women don't have access to alternatives to abortion. One of the lawmakers said that New York will fiercely protect women. Well, that's that's not true. Not if they're in the womb and not if, you know, at the last line of defense, they're looking for a sign of hope for some resource other than abortion. Uh, New York's not looking to protect them. We're almost out of time here, but quickly, um, how do you see this case playing out and what impact do you think that this lawsuit may have on the pro-life movement? Well, one of the impacts is there's a lot of confusion in New York about what Red Rose Rescue is and what a simple prayer vigil is. And, um, th and there have been efforts to stop the simple prayer vigils that we have in Lower Manhattan, for instance. Um, there have been times in the last months since Dobbs, where the police have asked us not to process the half a block from Old St. Patrick's to uh, to the abortion clinic, and we already stand across the street. We're not we're not standing in front. But one of the other things that uh, this might do is n not only impact the Red Rose rescuers, but a run of the mill sidewalk counselor who stands outside the abortion clinic offering brochures, resources, and. Uh, you know, in one sense, most of the abortions in America are not happening happening at abortion clinics anymore. But if you are going in because it's a later term abortion, you, you have a right to have a conversation with someone who wants to offer you resources. So that's a real danger in, in New York State. Well, Catherine, so great to be with you, my friend, and um, getting all your insights on everything. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Tracy. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including gathering of church leaders. U.S. bishops hold their first public day of discussions at the spring assembly. We have reaction from Orlando. Plus, we hear from a Catholic farmer in Louisiana who is facing major backlash for defending the faith on social media. Conference of Catholic Bishops held its first public day of the 2023 Spring Assembly in Orlando, Florida. Today, the event featured remarks from Archbishop Timothy Broglio as well as the Papal Nuncio. Several topics were on the agenda. There were also a message to the Holy Father thanking him for his leadership of the church. The assembly wraps up tomorrow. And joining us now is Dr. Matthew Bunsen, Vice President and Editorial Director of EWTN News, who is in Orlando right now covering the meetings. Matthew, great to be with you as always. Uh, as we just heard, both the Papal Nuncio and the President of the USCCB spoke today. Uh, what stood out the most to you about their remarks? Yeah, there, were, there were two things. It's great to be with you, Tracy, especially from here where the bishops are gathered. Uh, two things really jumped out. Uh, the I, the question or the, the topic of synodality uh, has been overhanging uh, the U.S. church and, and, in fact, the global church for a number of years now at the request of Pope Francis. And that was very much a topic of conversation today, especially by the papal nuncio, uh, Archbishop Christophe Pierre, uh, who talked about synodality and Francis's vision for it, but also the efforts to commit to it, especially on the, the part of the U.S. church. Uh, he used the phrase that we've heard a number of times, that it sometimes is difficult to define synodality but he tied it uh, to the, the three-part aspect that we often hear from Pope Francis of encounter, of listening, and then of discerning. And interestingly enough, he tied the portion of discerning to the Eucharistic revival happening, of course, now also in the United States. Archbishop Broglio listed a number of the key items that the bishops are facing right now. One of them, of course, is a Eucharistic revival. Another is immigration. And he also touched significantly on the, the Dodger situation in Los Angeles. Hearkening, he said, this brings us back uh, to the questions of the know-nothings and the rise of intolerance against Catholics that we're seeing today. Yeah, Matthew, I know there are also discussions uh, about the Shreveport martyrs, five priests who died in Louisiana right. while they were ministering to the sick back in the 1870s. Um, tell us more about that. 
Yeah, so uh, as we have seen in, over the last years, the bishops have been asked to give their support to advancing the cause for beatification and canonization of various figures in American history. And in this case, it was the Shreveport Martyrs. Those are five priests uh, who were from Brittany in France. Uh, who came to the United States to serve and then found themselves in the middle of a crisis of yellow fever in Shreveport in, in 1873. Here we are on the 150th anniversary of that uh, horrendous event in which as much as a quarter of the population of Shreveport actually died from this epidemic. Each of these priests gave their lives in service to the church in caring the pastoral care for souls at the time. One by one they succumbed to the yellow fever and as uh, each of them headed into Shreveport to give care, pastoral care, the final rites uh, and uh, that sort of really pastoral needs of the dying, each of them knew that they were probably not going to survive this and indeed they didn't. Uh, so this heroic witness, uh, the word martyr itself comes from witness, uh, this heroic witness is something that has really stood the test of time and their cause has been open. So the bishops here have been asked to add their voice of support to advancing the cause. And uh, it was uh, quite a moment, I think, when we heard more details about their, their services and their death. As one of them said, I go knowing I will die, but this is the shortest road to heaven. Matthew, we have a little less than a minute left uh, or so, but quickly, what's on the yeah. agenda for tomorrow? Well, uh, tomorrow uh, the, the bishops are picking up a couple of important things. The first is uh, a discussion about whether to issue a revision of the health care directives. Uh, in other words, the ethics that uh, Catholic hospitals are expected to uphold. This has become very important in light of uh, transgender surgeries, a so-called euphemism for gender-affirming care, and the place and role of Catholic hospitals in opposing that in culture. Uh, the bishops are also going uh, to discuss their strategic priorities, uh, as well as a pastoral letter, a pastoral statement on the part of the bishops for people with disabilities. Uh, once again, the, the bishops uh, recognizing the pastoral need uh, that we have in the United States for those with disabilities. And then uh, we're likely to have as well an update from Bishop Robert Barron on the upcoming World Youth Day, uh, something that I know all of the bishops are very focused on and certainly that we as a network are also very focused on. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Bunsen, great to be with you as always. We appreciate it. Privilege to be with you. Take care. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, firmly planted, a Louisiana farmer defends his social media post honoring the sacred heart of Jesus. Plus, honoring St. Joseph, European artists gather in France for a special contest. in Louisiana is facing backlash and financial losses after recently posting on Instagram about celebrating the Sacred Heart of Jesus during the month of June rather than what he called, quote, attempted coup of the month. Ross McKnight, owner of Backwater Foie Gras Farmstead, says that he lost a whopping two-thirds of his restaurant business due to the post about the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the feast of which is tomorrow. And joining us now is Ross McKnight, owner of Backwater Foie Gras Farmstead. Ross, so good to be with you today. Uh, first off, tell us a little bit more about what you posted on Instagram and why you felt it was so important to do so. Sure, well, uh, we've all noticed the, the mounting attack on the family. As uh, Pope John Paul II said, this, this would be the last battle, really, the assault on the family. And so as we've seen that uh, become more and more powerful, uh, in opposition to God's law, it seemed necessary to just be a little more pointed with our message this year. I think last year we also celebrated the Sacred Heart during the month of June and promoted that. But this year, you know, we were just a little bit more uh, outspoken as to what it is we're opposing. So, Russ, were you surprised, um, you know, at the backlash that you received because of it? And did you think that you would lose some business, you know, over expressing your faith and opinions? Well, it's always possible, right? <laughs> um, we've, uh, but people know that we're Catholic because we'll post things about major feast days, celebrating major feast days, celebrating the seasons. Um, you know, I've mentioned something about Réveillon and how its roots are Catholic. Um, so, you know, there's always that chance. It just, I guess, be, perhaps it was because we were a little more pointed. Perhaps it was just, you know, the, the straw that broke the camel's back that finally meant that 
that people felt the need to drop us. But I think, you know, in the back of my mind, I probably always knew that it was inevitable. And at some point we'd run afoul of, you know, people who don't, of course, share our values. So. Well, we thank you for your witness. And I'm wondering, you know, Ross, on the flip side, have you received any support in regard to your post or your business because of all this? Yes. You know, that's the thing is it, we went from being in a lot of distress um, to almost overnight, everything being more than turned around and and just the, the outpouring of support from fellow Catholics and from people across the country who um you know, hold those those same particular values has been extraordinary, um, really unbelievable, really providential. We've been well taken care of. Um, if people do want to support us, I would just recommend to, of course, uh, pray the pray the novena to the Sacred Heart this month um, and enthrone your home. Uh, maybe start the Sacred Heart devotion, because this is very clearly the this is the the, the banner we need to fight under. That the battle has been laid out before us. It's very clear and. And we just have to, you know, accept that that we have a part to play. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even all, you know, with all of that, I know that this probably has not been easy on you and your family. Uh, that said, I'm curious, Ross. You know, given the chance, would you do this again? Would you make that post again? Well, I mean, knowing what I know now, I mean, a thousand times, yes. <laughs> but, um, but it's it's. It, it's just an honor. Um, it's an honor to, to serve Christ the King. And I don't, you know, I certainly don't deserve it. Um, none of us do. But uh, I don't know, you know. I'm, I'm a man. All men grow up. Uh, they, are, they are little boys at one point who want to be knights. And they want to serve a king. And that desire never really goes away, even if it's, you know, really some people have tried to erase it. But we all, we all, as Charles Coulomb says, we all really grow up monarchists, and it's not a question of when we, uh, when we become monarchists, but when we stop being them to where we had to become them again, because we all want to serve Christ the King. So it's an honor, and, um, and I'm so grateful, and so, great, so grateful that I was lifted out of um, those dark moments and, and really, you know, just shown an outpouring of love from God and from my my fellow Catholics, so I, I'm re very grateful, um, and really. Well, um, well yes, Ross, I don't we're know grateful that you came. <laughs> we're grateful that you came on today. Yeah, we're grateful that you came on today. We're almost out of time, but quickly um, before we run out of time, I, I want to ask you this question: If people want to learn more about your farm and your products and what you all do, and maybe they want to help you out, where can they find more information? Certainly. Well, you know we. Now that this this movement's going under the banner of the Sacred Heart, we're trying to raise funds for for a chapel. Um, our local Latin Mass community doesn't have a chapel of its own yet, so we're working on that. If you follow our Instagram and you follow our uh, Facebook account, then you'll be able to follow that um, effort as well. And if you want to learn more about the farm, just go to backwaterfarmstead.com. Well, Ross, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. We're praying for you and your family, and we're grateful for your time today. God bless. Oh, thank you, and, and God bless you. Well, a Catholic group based in Europe providing outreach and support to families is announcing the winners of its contest dedicated to St. Joseph. The Federation of Catholic Family Associations in Europe organized the event to raise awareness for the work fathers do in all spheres of life. The ceremony was hosted at the European Parliament building in Strasbourg, France. Joining us now from France is Cornel Barboot, Vice President of FAFCE, the Federation of Catholic Family Associations in Europe. Cornel, welcome. Great to be with you today. Can you tell us more about this event and why you chose the figure of St. Joseph? Uh, nice to be with you today. Uh, that's a very good uh, opportunity to have a project of uh, Catholic families with uh, this European art contest. And uh, that's why we have this theme of St. Joseph. It's because uh, uh, at least we saw, at least my site in 2021, even if it was a year of St. Joseph, we didn't saw so many things about St. Joseph. Then. So, my personal experience is that I discover many people, unbelievable, so many people uh, which are loving 
St. Joseph. I saw, for example, two pilgrimages in uh, France and Canada, but also I saw a shrine of St. Joseph in uh, Ukraine, and I saw with these 126 applicants in this uh, contest, many of them are uh, lovers of uh, St. Joseph. So for me, it's an amazing trip to see how many people they still love St. Joseph. A part of the fact that there are seven counties in the world dedicated, consecrated to St. Joseph, my uh, personal achievement is that I'm expecting now more countries to consecrate in the next period to St. Joseph, because that's the time of St. Joseph we are living now. Yeah, it's so incredible. And I understand that this event also wanted to promote fathers' rights. Um, that said, can you tell us what the situation in Europe currently is regarding this issue? It's a clear, uh, big uh, fight uh, against fathers and against the families. So, uh, but that's what I see more and more, uh, for example, with the legal uh, in many counties uh, with paternal leave for both for fathers and mothers. This is an increasing uh, uh, framework, legal framework on one side. So, and on the other side, there are more and more fathers starting to contribute to the family and not only to the society. Because in the last years, I can say, that's big pressure for the fathers to be, to have contract with the society to produce money or to bring money home. But now more and more fathers are staying home, are uh, taking care about the education of children and involving in their families more and more. And I understand that your group continues to do really just wonderful work for families uh, in Europe. What are the main issues for European families, you know, right now? And how is your group helping them? So, like, uh, we see now one of the issues with the families is uh, to be involved fathers. It's uh, one issue. And second issue, what we see with FAFSA, we started uh, last year to make another project, which is... Uh, to make an alliance against uh, pornography, on digital uh, pornography. So here we are quite uh, happy with these uh, efforts and evolution. Within six months already, we have so many, let's say, uh, associations and people coming to us because the impact is very big. Well, Cornell, thank you so much for being with us, and thank you for all the great work that you're doing in Europe. We really appreciate it. God bless you. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.